Welcome to It's Your Business, a program designed to highlight our local small businesses who participate in contracting and procurement opportunities at Houston Community College. I'm your host, Veronica Douglas. If you haven't tuned in before, welcome back. If this is your first time tuning in, welcome. Either way, we're glad you're joining us on today as we highlight our local small businesses for the great work that they do. If you haven't subscribed to our newsletter, please do so today by visiting our website and clicking Let's Stay in Touch. Subscribing to our newsletter allows us to reach you in a uniformed manner, providing information about the Small Business Development Program and its community partners. So with that being said, let's get started. Possible Missions is a Texas-based company founded in 2001 by native Houstonian and entrepreneur Paula Mendoza. Initially starting up as a project management firm with just $100 in the bank, with time, Possible Missions transitioned into a procurement solutions firm. In 2010, Possible Missions partnered with Fisher Scientific, Scientific and became an authorized product distributor. Building on their successful growth, they further developed distributor relationships with two worldwide suppliers, Ecolab in 2017 and Medline Industries in 2018. Their current mission during the pandemic is to provide the highest quality PPE products and services through their exclusive relationships. Joining us today is Paula Mendoza, President and CEO. Welcome, Paula. It is honestly such a pleasure and an honor to have such a distinguished business owner here today with us. So welcome. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your passion. Hi, Veronica, and thank you for having me on today. Um, my passion is really working out in the community, making sure that we can provide jobs for those that are in need, as well as um, making sure that our customers have the utmost uh, ability to have their products that they need at any given time. And in this case, you mentioned PPE, uh, and during the uh, COVID times, it was very much a need. Um, I am a Houstonian. I was uh, raised on the north side of town um, and then moved uh, closer to downtown as uh, I got married and uh, and had a family. Uh, I am a product of public school education and uh, attended HCC many, 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 many years ago um, and then went on to graduate from the University of Houston downtown. I started in corporate America after I graduated from college and then decided at one point that um, I could do this on my own and worked with small businesses, worked as a consultant, and then got into supplier diversity and then branched off to project management and then now into a procurement solutions firm. Wow. So you've been in business for over 22 years? We have. We opened the doors in 2001. Wow. Tell us a little bit about your team and some of the services that you offer. Oh, wow. I, I tell you what, uh, if anybody tells you they do it on their own, I, I think they're fibbing just a little bit. Um, I can tell you that the team that I have is of the utmost integrity, customer service related, and they, I hope, right, that they love what they do. But I have a team that surrounds storerooms that are actually in our customer sites. We have a whole customer service team here at the corporate office. During COVID, uh, we were fortunate enough to buy a building uh, where we now house product for our customers. We saw a need and, uh, and were able to fill that need by purchasing a building. So half is operational and the other half is uh, available to store inventory for our customers. But my team has been here with me. Some of these folks have been here with me over 10 years. Some of my storeroom folks have been here since 2013. And they really, really provide me with that support as a CEO of the company. They run this on a day-to-day -day basis. I can tell you that I feel comfortable at any given time. You know, like most of us, we have to be out in the community. We are giving back. And when I do that, I feel very comfortable that my team here has, has my back, if, as they say. And I have interacted with your team, you know, Gilbert, I think he is amazing. You are as well. You guys do an outstanding job providing your services and supporting the community. 
So let's talk a little bit about po possible missions culture. What is the culture around possible missions? Well, I tell you what, it's all about culture and how you treat your employees. Um, during COVID, uh, I was fortunate enough to be named one of the CEO uh, recipients, uh, most favorite CEO recipients at the HBJ. And I think out of all of the recognitions that I've received, that one touched my heart the most because it was a it was a recognition from my employees that they submitted. And to me, I feel like we're a family. Um, we have a kitchen here that's a full service kitchen and we eat breakfast here, we eat lunch, people bring in groceries. And even when our customers come in, we provide them lunch. I can tell you that when I started my business, and maybe this is a little nugget that, that some can take away, I was very headstrong and I said, you teach every, you, every employee the same. Everybody should be treated the same. You know, there's no difference and, you know, just everybody should be the same. Um, and then life happens and then things happen in your own life where you realize that you can't treat everybody the same, right? Everybody has different issues, Every whether it's family, whether it's they have a family, you know, they get married, they come back, they leave and then come back to the company. And so um, it's so important, I think, that you treat everybody with the respect that you would like to be treated and to make sure that you're flexible, right? Especially this day and age with employees, making sure that you're flexible with employees, whether it's coming in a little late. We have several students from the University of Houston, Texas A&M. They leave to take a test and come back or they go into the conference room and study. Um, those are the type of things that, that I have ingrained in our team to say, if you need something, ask. Don't be afraid to ask. If you have to go to school two days a week, let's figure it out. How do we figure that out? So for me, being like a family, yet knowing we still have to run a business is incredibly important. And that goes back to being able for me to feel comfortable that when I leave, I don't have to be here. Everybody knows what they're doing. And knowing that they want to come to work every day is something that I take pride in. And I think that really shows. I was looking at some of your social media posts and you celebrate your employees' birthdays. You go to basketball games. You're even honored by the University of, of Houston with a happy birthday serenade. But you do, you make a point to show the good work that the families that you support are doing, you know, in the community. And I really think that means a lot and it shines through in everything that you're doing. Well, thank you. I really do think it's important, right? We come to work every day together. We were together for years and years. And so you learn everybody's family, what they're doing, how they're doing it. And at the end of the day, I am truly blessed to have the team that I have. And I just want to make sure that they, they feel the same way. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about some of your customers. Who are some of your customers? Who are you supporting? So we work a lot with higher ed. We do some community colleges, um, but really uh, have focused on higher ed for the past few years. So we work with the likes of U uh, UTMB, UTMB Anderson, UT Southwest. Um, we have Texas Tech and Baylor. So if it's a research facility, we work closely with them, providing them with all of their research needs, whether it's chemicals, PPE, we have now even uh, engaged our next niche uh, within our company is providing um, lab renovations, um, not necessarily the brick and mortar, but if they're having the renovation coming in beforehand and saying, we can provide you with all the products, you know, show us the blueprints, let us look at what you need. Here's, here's a quote on what we can provide you. So we're even branching out into that a little bit now. So higher ed, some community colleges, and then uh, not many K through 12 though. So how important is it to actually know your customer? Do you treat, obviously you don't treat all of your employees the same. So I'd like to say you don't treat all of your customers the same. Well, that's true. Um, you know, even our suppliers are different, right? Everybody has different needs. Everybody has different, um, I guess, the way they look at how you as a small business should be treated, right? So I will tell you this, and probably most small businesses will tell you the same. When a 
big customer, a, a, a large customer is dealing with a small business. They always want to see the CEO. They always want to see me. And where is Paula? And of course, you know, right? With a lot of customers, we're very blessed to have a lot of customers. That's hard. So one of the things that I did this year um, is I put I printed a whole calendar and I put on there how many customers I'm going to touch every week. And if it's via Zoom, if it's email, if it's a text, if it's a phone call, believe it or not, I still make phone calls. I know that's rare these days. Um, but I think knowing your customer is absolutely key, right? So we have UTMB that's in Galveston and they have clinics that we work in that are in different places, different Angleton, clearly. But knowing your customer and where they are could be totally different than a customer that's in the medical center, right? What are their needs? What are they looking to? So you have to know your customer to know what they're looking for, to know what, what they are anticipating. What is their vision? What are they going to be doing in a year or two? And I, I was on a call the other day and somebody asked me, so when you do a deal or when you make that first connection, how long does it take before you close that deal? And I can tell you, it'll take anywhere between 18 to 24 months. And if you expect anything sooner, um, good for you if you do that. But you really need to cultivate that customer, your relationship, and find out what it is that they need. At the end of the day, they may not need what you're selling, or they may not need, because we do project management services as well, they may not need that service, and that's okay. But they're on my calendar for a couple of maybe months later to say, hey, Veronica, how are you doing? It's been a long time since we've seen each other. Don't forget, I'm still out here if you need me, right? I think that is key. And you're right, just like our employees, um, our customers have family issues. Sometimes they leave, sometimes they come back to that same customer. So I think communicating with them and letting them know you're still out there. I'm not a, I'm not one that pushes. Um, I'll reach out. If you get back to me, great. If I see you at a community event, great. But at least I reach out and just say, I'm here if you need me. And I think it has worked for me. I can say that for me, that that has worked for the past 20 some odd years. What type of front end research do you normally do when you're approaching uh, potential clients? Do you research their websites, make cold calls? What do you tend to do to make that engagement start? So I tell you that we have been extremely blessed that our community work and our community involvement has involved us with so many of our hub coordinators, our small business coordinators that they know us. You mentioned Gilbert earlier. Gilbert's been in the, you know, he's been with me whoo, five or six years now, but he's been in the community just as long as I have. They know us. They trust us. So, wow, I, I'm just, it, it really gives me chills when I say we don't have to do many cold calls. We really don't. However, we will get an opportunity every once in a while. We'll get a university that will call or that we come across where we're not selling a, our product. We'll look at the website. I really go to the small business person first, whether it's a hub coordinator or a small business or whatever their titles are that, that, that deal with us small businesses, and we'll reach out to them. This is what we know. This is what we think. This is what we can provide you. Can you help me with some inroads? So that's how we target it. And then obviously... I reach out to our organizations, you know, uh, our Women's Business Enterprise Organization or the Houston Monterey Business Council, and I reach out to Angela. Angela, do you know so-and-so? I really need a connection there. We can sell them product. So know your community. If you're out there and, and you're always networking, can't cannot stress that enough, the business will come. You still have to communicate. You still have to network. But once they know you and know who you are out in the community, I think you earn that trust sometimes and that respect, and that goes a long way. I can tell you some of the customers that we're doing business with now, I met 20 some odd years ago at the Hispanic Chamber or the HMSDC. I didn't do business with them for 10 to 15 years. And now they could be one of our biggest customers. So um, it's important to be out there and be active, um, but yes, if you don't know the customer and they're new, absolutely do the research. And if you can find somebody that works there, get some intel from them as well. 
That's really good advice. And I honestly feel like I've known Gilbert longer than the five or six years that he's worked with you. Oh, yeah. Because he has been so engaged with the HCC operation. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that is really, really excellent advice. Yeah. Um, You talked a little bit earlier about your storeroom operations. What type of inventory are you holding? So what we did, actually, this was about a couple years before COVID. Uh, we were working with a customer and the customer kept saying, I can't buy any more product because I don't have anywhere to store it. And when we would go on site, which we do often, we would see our products underneath the researcher's desk. We would see them in the administrator's desk. The buyers had product underneath their desk and they're like, well, we don't have anywhere to put it. And uh, so, so we can't order anymore, but we need more. So that continued to happen with multiple customers. And in the higher ed space, you'll find that that's just happens all over. There's no space. And so what we did, if they don't have room to provide us with the storeroom on site, um, we listened, we listened, we started looking for property and that's why we uh, purchased the building. So half of the building is stacked with shelving. And so a perfect example is if somebody, COVID, right? So everybody was in need of gloves, everybody was in need of masks, but they didn't have anywhere to store it. So the opportunity for them to buy it today, because they needed to buy it right then before the stock was out, stock it in our warehouse. We we charge them a racking fee, and then they would they go through the process and tell us weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, how often do you want it, us to deliver it to you? And that's all included in the racking fee. So we have it here, pull it off the shelf, put it on the truck, and deliver it. And that was one of the things we got from listening to our customers over and over. And it took a couple of years, but we continue to hear the same thing over and over. We have no room to store our product. Um, so we listened and uh, we invested and uh, we're still building that practice. Wow. And so I imagine you'll let your customer know when the stock gets low and when it's time to reorder. Do you manage all of that for them as well? Absolutely. If it's in our warehouse, we do. And we have some on-sites as well. And the on-sites, we manage the inventory. So if they're getting low, we already have the ability to reorder. And or sometimes I call it the 7-Eleven model, where the researchers come in, they pick off the shelf, they have a PO, we place the order, and that automatically uh, makes the inventory, you know, uh, makes the reorder process easier. And so when you say on-sites, you mean you actually have on-site stores at some of your customers' locations? Right. Storerooms, actually. That's actually how we started our business in 2013 with Fisher Scientific. So another, another nugget, uh, the CMBL, which is the directory for the state of Texas that you can participate in once you become a hub, a hub contractor, is that's how Fisher, with the help of one of my hub managers that knew us, uh, found us and found our information, and that's how they called us. And so uh, it was to manage storerooms that were on site at the customers, not to sell the product, but we are a project management company as well. And so we bid on managing um, four storerooms at the time that ended up turning into seven. And then we grew that relationship. We made sure that they knew who we were. They then trusted us, respected us as a small business. And that's when they started talking to us about selling their product three years later. There's that 24 month period or so. Uh, not turned into three years, but in three years, we began selling their product. And now we're all over the state of Texas and other states uh, with that supplier. So did the COVID pandemic actually help you gain new customers? I'm sure the customers that you currently have, you know, saw the true, true value in you being able to get that PPE so quickly and store it for them and get it in their hands. Did you so, gain a lot of new customers during COVID as well? Yes. Um, so sorry to interrupt. Um, it was kind of, um, um, you know how much uh, we're involved in the community and out there. And for our current customers, it was great. But that's where the supplier also, right? Having that relationship with our and our partnership with Fisher is that when one of our customers called us and said, we've got to have this, or we've got to have this because our research can't continue if we don't get this delivered. And now it's backordered in this. And so we worked hand in hand with Fisher to say, okay, here's our customer, whomever it might've been, right? UTEP or MD Anderson. So we would call Fisher and say, what do we need to do? Do we pull it from a different warehouse? 
what what do we need to do to get this customer? So that was the great part about our relationship with our our our, our supplier and our partner. Um, and then we found we weren't able to help those that were in the community that needed things because all of that stuff was already on allocation and we couldn't get it. And so um it you know, as much as we wanted to help and either donate or get product for those that weren't kind of already customers, it was difficult to say no, Veronica. It was it it just really hurt our heart. Um, but uh, we were able to to take care of our customers, and they're important, right? They're hospitals. They're doing research that that you know has been going on for years sometimes, and if it stops, all of that research goes away. So hugely important. A little bit. Um, disheartening because we couldn't help more people in the community. But if I can offer another nugget here, <laughs> um, we also had a lot of vendors calling us saying, we can provide you with masks, we can provide you with gloves, we can all coming from overseas. And a couple of things, right? You had to pay in advance with a credit card. You never knew if you were going to get the product. You can only do so much research trying to get this in, this product quickly. But we said no. And there was a lot of people that said, why? You could be making tons of money. You could be selling to the city or to you know your community colleges or to your customers. I said, you know what? My reputation is worth more than getting a product and putting it into a hospital or a clinic when it wasn't stand, you know, up to standards. I won't do it. And so we had to make that decision to say no to where. We, we could have brought in a great deal of revenue. The other is on contract, right? That That is continual. But we had the opportunity and, and we made the decision to say no because I, would, I did not want to answer to the hospitals and clinics when something was not up to standard or it, it could have harmed a process. Right. right. Sometimes you have to make those decisions in, and not just think about the income or the revenue that's coming into the business. Mm -hmm. Because I know a lot of that product that was received in some agencies, you know, was expired before it was in hand or the masks were not up to the quality. So, yes. you know, another excellent decision on your part. That's why you've been in business over 22 years, right? So um, tell me a little bit about the supplier diversity certifications do you hold, that you hold? So um, I tell everybody I'm certified in just about anything you can possibly be certified except for being a veteran. Um, we uh, have our state certification, the hub certification. We have our woman certification, uh, minority certification. We have the WOSB certification with the federal government and the small business uh, certification. We graduated from the 8A, uh, which was extremely, extremely wonderful program. But I will also tell folks that want to get 8A certified, don't do it until you're ready. Don't to do it until you have a good track record because those eight years will come and go and you'll miss out on a lot of opportunities. Um, we did well. Uh, we could have done so much better, um, but it was it is it is a great program, but you have to know it and you have to be ready when you get your certification so that you don't waste it. eight years seems like a long time, but it'll go by quickly. So those are the certifications that we have. We have some in different other different states as well. And then some of them are um, where you can use one state for the other. So uh, if a customer is in need, we'll, we'll apply for certification and, and we pretty much get it. There's a very, there's some picky states out there, but for the most part, we can get certified. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the involvement that you have in the community? I know that you're involved with the census. What are some of the other things that you're doing with the community? So um, our community work, and the census was a great project, right? We worked with Alex Lopez Negrete and other small business, and um, we worked with them and did some of their community outreach and their training. Um, we are really focused, and I like to focus on education, both on the student side as well as the small business side. And we also look to get involved with workforce development. So like said, for instance, it's all about workforce development, and I'm currently serving as the chair there. And that organization that I've been involved with for many years is one of the most 
satisfying organizations where I spend my time because you can see a difference. You can see, you know, some of the folks that are getting a job where they wouldn't have, um, and, and they're making, they're changing their lives, right? Um, from an education standpoint, this year we started and next year we will fully go to um, contributing dollars to just scholarships. I want to make sure we always have, but sometimes there's a table and somebody wants you to buy a table and there's this and that. But for me, when I can put money directly into students' hands for their education, that's key for me. And one of the things that, and so we're involved in all the chambers and the networking, the small business groups. But for me, if it has to do with student education and small business education and workforce development, those are the things that we spend a lot of our community time on. And I, if I can, I'm gonna tell you my most proudest, um, I've set up an endowment under my mother's name oh, nice. at the University of Houston oh, wow. for the mariachi program. And the reason the mariachi program is a little different is because it is part of the music school. So a lot of times it's a student-led program and that's wonderful. But U of H and the, and the music school has embraced the program and so, is the last thing my mom was able to see me accomplish before she passed. And uh, and so that was a way of me leaving a legacy for her name. But that money goes directly to students that are in the program, the music program at U of H. It could be books, it could be tuition, it could be if they're taking a national trip for a competition. And so that's what we like to focus on in the community is education, and small business, you know, I'm always advocating for small businesses um, and their workforce development. Well, Paula, thank you so much again for coming on and closing. Please tell our viewers how they can contact you. What is your website? Wonderful. Yes. So www.possiblemissions.com. And we're on social media, POSMIS, POS underscore MISS. You can find us. Uh, we have a Facebook uh, we have a great social media team. And so uh, please reach out to us. There's a way to reach out to us there. And uh, you can always send me an email at paula at possiblemissions.com. Well, thank you again, Paula. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you for having me, Veronica. I appreciate you asking me to join you today. For It's Your Business, I'm your host, Veronica Douglas, and we will see you next time.